coding in progress. So this is kind of going to be going to be a discussion on ancient astrology. And uh, whenever you have questions or whenever you you have something that you want to say or any idea or whatever, you can just uh, talk or I mean, yeah, you can interrupt me. So it's great. It's this will be like a discussion. Uh, yes. So ancient. Welcome to the Nordic Young Astrologist, then, and we're going to talk about the ancient astrology today. So basically, uh, and here we have, we have on the left we have Athena, goddess of wisdom, to help us, and we have Hercules on the right. Hercules who performed the twelve labors, one of the myths about him. Uh, twelve, of course. Some people say that it's linked to the 12 uh, uh, signs of the zodiac, but who knows? Yeah, maybe, probably. Uh, so, uh, what is ancient astrology then? Um, yes, well, uh, how do we begin? Well, in the, in the Western uh, in the Western uh, tradition, we have uh, basically the Egyptian and the Mesopotamian and the Hellenistic. So those who are considered the oldest ones are the Egyptian and Mesopotamian. And uh, uh, I guess that's all of you. You also, Amanda, you are a kind of, uh, uh, you know a bit of astrology before. Or are you a complete beginner? Or Me? Yes, are you a complete beginner? Yes. or? Uh, no, I know. <laughs> oh, great. So, so then, uh, but I'm not uh, the Hellenistic astrology. Hmm. I'm not. Okay. But, yeah. Yes. Just, so just uh, so I get an idea of how how detail I have to discuss. But anyway, so the Egyptian astrology, there, there's no consensus. Uh, there's no exact uh, figure. I think when it began, but I mean, it's one of the oldest civilizations. So at least. A couple of thousand years before Christ, all the way what all the way up to the Hellenistic era. So the Hellenistic era, I can just say shortly what it means. The Hellenistic time is a uh, the Hellenistic period began about uh, about the death of Alexander the Great, uh, or from the death of Alexander the Great to about the uh, Emperor Augustus, like when he the Battle of Actium. So when when he sort of conquered Greece, you could say, or conquered Mark Antony and Cleopatra. So, yeah, about 300 years or so. That's for the Hellenistic period, historically, when we're talking about the, like, historical figures. It's not exact like that, but anyway, that's what, uh, that's the academic figures. So, it basically has to do with the conquest of Alexander the Great. So, when he began there in the, 330s or something before Christ, so, or when he died, 323, he had conquered like all the way to the eastern parts of the world, all the way to India. So, <clears throat> because of many reasons, different reasons. So, uh, yes, and uh, with that came the spread of the Greek culture and like the a new form of uh, Greek language called the Kine language the general, the common or universal uh, form of Greek, so to speak. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, with all that kind of culture and the literature and the founding of new cities and all that. And uh, yeah, one of the sort of hot pots was Alexandria in Egypt, where everything like came together, the culture before Greek and uh, Greece and everything. And uh, yes. But during this Hellenistic time, the Roman Empire rose as well. I mean, this is after Alexander died. Uh, his successors had wars between themselves and etc. And then uh, the Roman Empire uh, uh, also expanded with Julius Caesar around the 50 before Christ or something. And after Julius Caesar came Emperor Augustus. And that's, yeah, that's considered sort of the end and the beginning of the Roman Empire era or the Roman Imperial period, but yeah. So Hellenist, but Hellenistic astrology is based, or it's sort of uh, the time period is from about third uh, century before Christ to like 
500 between 500 and 700 after crisis so it's it's much longer i mean than the historical period so it's basically just a name for the technique that was uh, uh sort of developed there is no consensus about this but either it was developed during the hellenistic times or it was uh, like uh, sort of created a new form of astrology but i believe it was just more developed so anyway and then yeah, the Egyptian, as uh, said, was uh, before this, and the, one of the things that was is still extant, still exists, is the Dendera Zodiac, which is, uh, 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 again, there's no consensus about when that <clears throat> was for a crate or a manufacturer, <laughs> but uh, it was found like in a period, inside of a, it's basically Egyptian Zodiac that was found inside of a temple. And uh, uh, that's one of the uh, things that is still exist. And then you have the Mesopotamian, so called the Mesopotamian is a, uh, is just a collective name for all these cultures that lived around the Mesopotamian era. So area, so Babylon, the Akkadians, the Sumerians, which were some of the most ancient, and then the Assyrians and Babylonians, and importantly the Chaldeans. That's what they were called. Some of the these uh, specific astrologers of this area. Uh, yeah. As is, so the, you see the timeline here. Um, <clears throat> is that why? Because I used to say like Babylonian astrology or when do people say Mesopotamian and Babylonian for that time period? Is it just like um, uh, a matter of taste or uh, uh... no not at all it's a good question not at all a matter of taste it's it's just uh, the Mesopotamia has become like the new way of uh, uh, calling these cultures I mean I was at a lecture okay. a couple of years ago when a historian said that uh, kind of the new name now is Mesopotamia for all these cultures but uh, but in so reality it's everything near the rivers yeah exactly near the oh. T Tigris River, Euphrates and Tigris, so around that yeah. area. Modern day Iraq and Iran and uh, yeah, Syria, all yeah, around that area. So the, the thing is, uh, it's sort of a name for collective name for all those cultures, but for the ancients, it wasn't so, it was more specific because even in mm -hmm. Greece and in Rome and everywhere. They had specific, all of Europe actually. They had like specific names for different peoples, nations, and tribes. So we'll get to that soon. <clears throat> but uh, the Chaldeans is a name that often comes up in the texts and in history. So yes, I, what what else? Well, uh, Mesopotamian. So that was like mainly the mundane astrology. So interpreting omens for the kingdom and uh, for the nation. And mm -hmm. Now it's believed that sort of the difference between Mesopotamia and Egyptian was the Egyptians had more focus on that sort of the the, the, the decans and the, the I mean you you know you all know about the decans the they have the yes. three different decans in every sign for for ten uh, degrees each uh, yeah so like the Babylon, the Babylonians were more seem to be I mean, much more focused on uh, interpreting omens and mundane astrology because they were like civil servants to the state, and the astrology was like intertwined with religion and politics. Uh, mm -hmm. For the Egyptians, it was more uh, following the ecliptic and the. Uh, uh, Perhaps more horoscopic, but uh, there's not much evidence for that either. But, but uh, anyway, <clears throat> so I wanted to dwell a bit on this, uh, the Chaldeans. So j just to get to, so because when it comes to the timeline, uh, we have sort of fantastic figures from the ancients. But anyway, so about the Chaldeans, <clears throat> this is a text about from Theodorus. Uh, a historian called Diodorus Siculus, the mid first century before Christ, uh, Bibliotheca Historica. So, this is a translation made by uh, two leading scholars, um, 
Alex, Alexander Jones, especially a leading scholar in the astronomy of uh, the ancients, a bit about astrology as well. So he says, it appears, or the other says, it appears to us not unfitting to discourse briefly about the people in Babylon called Chaldeans. So the people in Babylon called Chaldeans and, and their antiquity. So to leave out none of the things where they mentioned. Well, well then, the Chaldeans being among the most ancient Babylonians have a rank in the subdivision of the state comparable to the priests in Egypt. Uh, for having been assigned to the cultivation of the gods, they practiced philosophy for all, all the time of their life. Having a very good repute, repute in uh, astral science, astrology. Uh, they also adhere to a great extent to divination, mandike, making forecasts about the things that are going to happen, and they undertake to supply turnings away, apotope of evil things and fulfillments of good things. But some of the evils and goods by purifications, some by sacrifices, and some by various other incantations. They have experience in divination by birds and pronounced interpretations of dreams and monstrosities. And they also perform matters of ecstasy in a manner not lacking in wisdom, considering it to be supremely successful. The education, mathesis that they carry out for all these things is not like those of the Greeks who practice such things. And after that, he continues to <laughs> say rather negative things about the Greeks compared to the Babylonians, <laughs> that uh, the Greeks were more like quarreling about philosophical issues or they had different ideas about these things. And the Babylonians and the older nations had more were more uh, had their traditions which they stick to. But the Greeks were sort of, according to him, had uh, uh, were more like <clears throat> discussing things and being skeptical and having different viewpoints. So, uh, yeah. So, ecstasy, that, that, that's like, um, that was a form of divination where they, when they were, uh, uh, looking at the future, uh, future of different things by investigating the entrails of the sacrificial victims, sacrificial animals. For instance, if for instance, if a sacrificial animal was made during a specific day by Caesar, and and then uh, like there was no heart in the animal when they cut it open, then that would mean like a negative thing for for the emperor or for for whatever they were seeking. So it was quite specific things. And yeah. We'll get to the divination thing there. So Cicero, <clears throat> one of the, he says in the, the, the divination, when they say that for 470,000 years, the Babylonians have been taken and comparing the horoscopes of all children born, they are wrong. For if they had been doing it, they would not have stopped. And indeed, we should have a witness who either says it happens or knows if it ever did. So Caesar was sort of skeptical of this figure, 470,000 years, <laughs> uh, which will, but now, uh, again, uh, whenever you have questions or anything, just you can just stop me and interrupt me, so, uh, because I have prepared quite a bit, but uh, I don't know if we will make it, have time to go through everything. Uh, Concerning the, so he said, the orders continues. He says, concerning the number of years in which they say the college system of the Chaldeans has made the science of matters concerning the cosmos, astronomy and astrology, one would not easily believe for the account 473,000 years to the crossing over of Alexander from when they began of old the observations of the stars. Let us be satisfied with what has been said about the Chaldeans, so that we should not any longer digress from the proper history. Having previously spoken about the kingdom of the Assyrians, I will destroy the Lamedes, we will proceed next from the place. So, <clears throat> what the two modern scholars, then, uh, Jones and Steele's, their notes about this is, uh, they said, the order is summing up, of, summing, summing up accounts for the Chaldeans, supreme competence, astral science on the grounds that they have been observing the stars for 473,000 years. Uh, this number may have its origin in one of the various traditional king lists that are known from Babylonia. For example, one version of the Sumerian king list, 
clocks a period of 456,000 years to the six kings who ruled before the deluge. <clears throat> All the other versions give periods roughly half this long. Berossus, which was a very important astrologer in Hellenistic times from Babylon or the Chaldean, he assigns a period of 432,000 years to the same antediluvian kings, to the pre-deluge kings. As for the antiquity of Babylonian astronomical observations, though classical sources transmit the variety of to us absurdly large time intervals, it is curious that several cluster near the order of figure 490,000 years, according to Barossus and Crito Demos, as reported by Plinio the Elder, and 480,000 years, according to Julius Africanus, as reported by Sinkelus, and 470,000, according to Posidonius, who was uh, an important uh, philosopher, also during the, around this time. <clears throat> so yeah, this is a, sort of uh, just a funny remark about uh, time periods compared to the <laughs> epidemic figures and what the ancients themselves said. So, because in history for me or for, for everyone actually, it should be that it's most important to uh, l let the ancient texts speak for themselves first, like what they have to say about their own world, about their own history, before we make like judgments or whatever, or, before we make opinions or about the ancient world. So, yeah. Uh, can, can, quite the difference. <laughs> 490,000 years compared to like 400, 4,000 years. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, so let's talk about a little bit of history. Then. <clears throat> Uh, so, the uh, Hellenistic astrology itself was sort of uh, <clears throat> had sort of three main branches: natal astrology, called Genethliologia, and universal astrology, which was the mundane astrology, Catholicos, and then uh, Monday, no, inceptional astrology, Katarchia, which is both the, is a term both for the modern inceptional and the modern electional astrology. Uh, so inceptional is like when you, uh, uh, it's mainly for beginning something, but it was often for made to find the gestation period of uh, the fetus, so to speak, or when the person was first uh, conceived in the in the womb, so to speak. <clears throat> that was kind of important as well, and also for rectification. Uh, yeah, and they sort of had interrogational or orary astrology, whatever you call it. What do you call it? Orary? Or... Yeah. I think so. <laughs> so they <laughs> had uh, uh, that kind of astrology as well, but uh, it hasn't been really found in many texts, only in one instance it has to your feet, and probably in Dorotheus. So this is an important thing I want to mention. Uh, I hope you, you, all, you all can see the pictures there, yeah? Yeah. So, or do, do you see like my mouse when I turn it around? Or the, yes. do you see your own pic, your own faces on the video? Like when I do like this? No, anyway, because <laughs> <laughs> it, it might uh, disturb the picture, so anyway. <laughs> Uh, so the heavenly writing that was like an important uh, concept with like the signs from the gods so we'll, we'll go into this later but it was basically it was two, there were two basic ideas of either the stars were stars and planets the constellations were either signifying things or they were causing things upon earth uh, uh, so the stars and constellations is like a heavenly writing for us to read and to interpret uh, this lived on through Hellenistic times from Babylonian times at least to Hellenistic times with Aratus phenomena which is one of the texts uh, one of the most uh, Aratus phenomena was one of the most uh, well read, more well, most read texts uh, after it was written. 
Cicero knew of it and many other like learned people knew it because it was sort of it was a poetical text based on uh, sort of the language of Homer, the Iliad, and uh, like in a poetical fashion in, in the metrical system. And uh, uh, it was uh, it was basically a, a, it's called a versification of uh, of Evdoxus. It's a, it was a vers versification of a previous astronomical work, which which dealt with the constellations and the risings of the stars and the, how you how you can see the constellations, how you can learn to notice them, like in the sky, just with your eyes, looking at them during the night, for instance. Uh, and this was very helpful for navigation navigators and for seafarers and farmers. So, it was a well read, a very read, a widely read text uh, around this phenomena uh, written in Greek. So, that's one to remember as well. I have written a short uh, essay on it in one course. So, we could probably upload that to our site later. Uh, Yes, what I, what I wanted to say about that text is that uh, it, it had also like description of celestial phenomena or weather phenomena and uh, how to interpret uh, uh, how to interpret the weather from the stars and stuff like that and uh, and even how to well, how to forecast the weather how to forecast the weather like from uh occurrences like in nature <clears throat> and many things so anyway uh, uh the heavenly right so on the left you see also a picture from a book from the 1692 jacques curiosity curiosity so the unheard of curiosities concerning talismanical sculpture of the persians the horoscope of the patriarchs and the reading of the stars so this it's called the Celestial Hebrew Alphabet. So what I wanted to sh show by this is that this kind of tradition of heavenly writing lived on uh, from the most ancient times until like, yeah, the 17th century at least. Uh, this concept that you could uh, basically look at the stars and read them like a, like a book. And there was this concept of a book of nature, so to speak, where you could... Uh, read the signs in the creation of God or the creation of the gods because the specific signs for things have been uh, laid down everywhere especially among the stars and in the nature as well <clears throat> yeah so but this is kind of uh, and this author Jacques Gaffarel he was kind of he kind of exaggerated this into like that you can see specific uh, alphabets in the, in the constellations, but uh, there were different viewpoints about this. Yeah. So, on the right, we have Ptolemaeus, right? <clears throat> wood carving of Ptolemaeus and Astoli personified. So, <clears throat> um, the primary contributions then of the, the Babylonians introducing the zodiac and natal astrology was begun and the mathematical predictions of astronomy, uh, past and future. So moving on then, uh, we have uh, an interesting thing again about the history of the uh, astrology. So the Roman emperors they were kind of, uh, well, the Romans in general were kind of uh, suspicious of everything coming from the East, even from Greece in the beginning. So uh, they were suspicious because it, it was seen like sort of feminine, everything that came from like the East, Eastern parts. But uh, yeah, they, they <clears throat> are like weak, weak, weak things and like, uh, Stuff like that, but not literally, but anyway, 
and they they change their opinions about this later, and they realize that the Greeks and the Eastern nations had much to offer to them, since they had conquered so much. So they, uh, anyway, they the, the Roman emperors had was they were kind of strict even before Christianity against astrology. There were edicts and like there were things prohibiting astrology from being disseminated uh, by some of the emperors. But uh, that was also, the opposite was also true at the same time. So what was probably happening was that, happening was that since the Romans also had a, a very uh, significant belief in the, uh, the divination, We'll get to that later, what it means exactly, but uh, they had a specific, a specific significant belief in uh, predicting things that you could foretell the future, uh, for instance, from sacrificial victims or from animal victims and or from uh, uh, the winds, and like the birds, specifically the birds. They had their specific priests, the augurs, who would look at the flight of the birds and stuff like that. And the uh, lightning, all of that to foretell the future. So there are stories, for instance, where uh, eagles were seen before battle above. That was a good omen from the gods, for instance, for, for Zeus. The, the symbol of Zeus was the eagle. So, so uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where was I now? Um, yeah, they had, they had uh, certainly they had their, all their own beliefs in divination. So the emperors probably, those who prohibited the the use of astrology, was it was mainly for their own, like because they wanted to perhaps prohibit the fore foretelling. Uh, uh, what would happen to the empire or to the emperor himself? So the horoscope of the emperor was sort of forbidden also to uh, disseminate. I think I think it was so at all times, especially at least during Augustus and later. But to the Tiberius, for instance, and many other emperors before and after, they had their own uh, court astrologers. So, yeah. So one of the Augustus was like one of these, uh, as we see here in the picture, he was one of the most significant emperors who came directly after Julius Caesar and uh, succeeded sort of the imperial throne. And uh, he, he, he was sort of, he, he considered himself to be the one who would bring order back to the empire or bring order back to the, the great the vastness which Caesar had to conquer to bring yeah bring back sort of more good moral conduct to the Romans and to everyone that laws law the laws should be followed and stuff like that so this is a short story about him and it's um, uh this is from Suetonius, Lives of the Caesars. Suetonius was a historian, but it was uh, a work by he wrote biographies, but not all of that is uh, sort of reliable because it's uh, he he <clears throat> mixed up like um, historical facts with uh, gossip and all, all kinds of things. But anyway, so one of the stories about Augustus and his while in retirement at Apollonia. Augustus mounted the, with Agrippa to the studio of the astrology of Theogenes. Agrippa was the first to try his fortune. Agrippa was the general of Augustus, an important, an important general, military general. So Agrippa was the first to try his fortune, and when a great and almost incredible career was predicted for him, Augustus persisted in concealing the time of his birth and in refusing to disclose it, <clears throat> with sort of diffidence and fear that he might be found to be less eminent. When he at last gave it in unwillingly and hesitatingly, and only after many requests, Theogenes sprang up and threw himself at his feet. From that time on, Augustus had such fate in his destiny 
that he made his horoscope public and issued a silver coin stamped with the sign of the constellation Capricornus, under which she was born. So apparently he chose to make his horoscope public, and uh, I don't know if it's... Then there's a question if it, it was correct, and like because of the... or if it was on purpose, like propagandized or something, but... Uh, because the the Romans had a specific calendar system, which was kind of really weird. They would count like, oh, today is the 15th day before 15th of Mars. Like, for, or if you want to say like 1st February, they would say today is the day 15 days before 15th of February. <laughs> it was kind of uh, complex. Uh, but uh, yeah, so the, the calendar system was changed around Julius Caesar. He, so there's no consensus really about if he was a Capricorn or, but it, probably his moon sign was in Capricorn, or perhaps his ascendant, or perhaps his sun sign. And as we see on the left here, here's a coin from that time. The Cap, as I say, the Capricorn the sea goat holds the world between his four legs, with the name Augustus on the same face on the of the coin. Uh, the imagery suggests that Augustus, like his, astrolog like his astrological emblem, controls the world. But, uh, I mean, <clears throat> Capricorn must have been some kind of... Uh, uh, it must have been some kind of... Uh, uh, specific signification for him. But as we know... Capric Capricorns are sort of managers and author can be authoritarian leaders, so like good leaders and or bad, of course, but it depends on the different things. But there is often some sense of authority to when Saturn is well placed. Capricorn specifically, there is one idea that his inception was in. Capricorn, or he was, uh, his mother was, so to speak, um, uh, you say now, pregnant with him when the sun was in Capricorn, so with exceptional astrology. So that might have been one of the reasons, because it's it's believed that he was born in September, and then yeah, nine months before that would be like around Capricorn. <clears throat> so yeah, it's an interesting thing here about the emperors and astrology. Because there was also uh, this astrology of Thrasilus, was a uh, court astrologer of Tiberius who came, I think, almost right after Augustus, or close after. And there's like these interesting stories about uh, Thrasilus that uh, uh, these sort of fantastical stories or like funny stories that may be true or not, but he was uh, the Emperor Tiberius was fond of like astrology and he used to invite astrologers to foretell his future or something like that and uh, if they could not if they answered wrong he would throw them off the cliff well that's the story at least and then uh, Thrasilus was invited and then he asked Thrasilus uh, or he Thrasilus the astrologer predicted like accurate things about the emperor and other things I think and then that uh, he was asked, what do you, the emperor asked him, like, what do you see about your own fortune right now? And then Thrasilus supposedly said, oh, I see danger, great, great danger, because he could have been thrown off the cliff. <laughs> so because, and then because he recognized that, then he became sort of the court astrologer to be this. So, yeah. Thrasilus is sort of an important astrologer during, during that time. <laughs> I was might have been connected to the Platonic Academy as well. Um, so if you continue with the philosophy then of Hellenistic astrology, um, there's an interesting oath. Uh, so this is the Astrologer's Oath by Julius Firmicus Maternus from the 4th century Anno Domini. And the, uh, I want, this is this is interesting to read because you can understand what sense they or how they 
conceptualize astrology and how they, what kind of values they attributed to astrology. Uh, most of them, or if not all of them, during the ancient times. Yeah, I've been thinking about the number three a lot, like that it's actually a responsibility and maybe not because it can be so misconstrued. <laughs> Um, so, sorry, the number three. Uh, on in the oath. Oh yeah. We beg you to take an oath. Passage three. Is... <clears throat> yeah, passage three. Will not be revealed to profane ears, but that the entire teaching of divinity will be made known only to those equipped with. <laughs> because um, I'm just thinking about when you. <laughs> okay, it's good to learn about astrology and it can be empowering. But if you're not ready for it and make it too much your God, <laughs> then it's not empowering. Just that thing, for example. Mm. Like when is it good to learn and when is it not good? Yeah, I, I mean, so you mean basically that... You have, we have to be careful not to put too much uh, value in the statements of astrology. Do you mean like too much? Uh, uh, no, I, deterministic? Uh, I, I mean more that you have to be ready somehow. Both that you as an astrologer, when people put power in your hands, mm. like you have to know that it's some kind of power mm. and you have to know the person you meet like your ego, you have to be ready. Your relationship with your ego has to be right mm. before you use this tool. Because otherwise it can be used to hurt. Do so you know both yourself and... Yeah. Yes, Does that, anyone else? Um, that's a great point, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I agree. It's uh, So <clears throat> that's one of the reasons why they... I mean, Valens, the other astrologer, has one of the important astrologers, has a, also sort of an oath and like similar statements. So, because there's this idea that these are sort of mysteries, divine mysteries, and the divine teachings are this is a divine science because they, they view the planets as the planets have the names of the gods and stuff like that. The signs. So, yeah. There is an importance of uh, taking it seriously, especially when you are knowledgeable, or like when you understand the symbolism, or uh, when you have experience and stuff like that. And as you said, not not to hurt uh, is an important. Yeah. But, uh, it's like okay, if I see, perhaps you are close to your death <laughs> or something like that. I never seen that, but is this something? I should share. Is this mm. what? Yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> That's, um, yeah. The, the ethics of astrology and the, uh, what sh should be, what should be like hinted at to the native or what should like be asked. It's always best, I think, to ask things when you have, I think, when you have a reading or something. It's best to like, uh, sort of, if you if you notice a symbolism and then like, oh, this might mean death of someone or you know, like or a, a her illness or whatever, then you can, might ask like, oh, how do you feel about this or that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so, okay. So, just a short yeah. In the beginning here, it says, "Cum incognitis humanibus ovius sacrorum." Ceremonious, since we all know Latin now, can okay. he says one orphan? <laughs> orphan's initiated strangers into his mysteries. He required nothing of them but an oath, uh, an oath backed by the fearful authority of religion, that the rites once learned would not be betrayed to profane ears. It is generally agreed that Plato also was concerned that the cherished uh, concepts of his, his secret discourses should not be revealed to the untaught. Pythagoras too and our believe that their ideas should be enshrouded in religious silence. 
If the fallen rule of these men, my dear lords, I beg you to take an oath by God, the creator of the universe, who has made and regulated everything under the control of everlasting necessity, etc., etc. <clears throat> so, yeah, as you said, it's, yeah. Uh, and he goes back, he, he turns to a sort of philosophical authority, Pythagoras and Plato, and these authorities who were like, you know, uh, who could be quite re religious in a sense, but the Pythagorean doctrines were sort of religious or at least spiritual. Not religious in the modern sense, perhaps, but uh, spiritual and, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I think one of the two of the reasons for like having an oath was to keep away ulterior motives, like bad motives, as we sp spoke about, and then sort of the pro those who they they call it profane and those who are unworthy of these things and uh, but also because they consider this to be like great secrets and uh, which gave one knowledge of the future events yeah and also because it was a great trouble for some of them to like uh, find these doctrines and and uh, like uh, for instance valens mentioned this as well that he <clears throat> he was. He had. Uh, he had sort of recovered zodiacal releasing this timing uh, technique. He sort of recovered by himself, or the specific technique he he uses in Egypt around the time of like two hundred after no, hundred around hundred after Christ that century. So, I mean, the, these people went to great lengths probably to recover. Even in their time, they had to like recover these things sometimes. So, yeah. Yeah, so let's continue. So, uh, I don't know how long this will be, but uh, maybe one and a half hours or something. I mean, I think and I should have covered most of it. So, the philosophy, I mean, the key word is divination, though. A form of interpretation of the will of the gods, as we kind of spoke about. And then, uh, yeah, uh, the original ideas was the same throughout uh, <clears throat> astrology as in Mesopotamia. So astronomical phenomena seen by the eyes, like the visual astronomical phenomena, especially the seven wandering planets, which compared to the fixed stars, the fixed constellations were like wandering around. So you could see with your own eyes, the Mesopotamians could see that... Uh, what was always changing in the sky was the moon and the seven planet, or the seven planets general. Uh, yeah. So that was like they contributed. They saw that as important. And then, for instance, with the house system, <coughs> we had the uh, the tenth house was most conspicuous because it was above. Uh, Like it, it was where the sun travels in the ecliptic, it was at the top. So that became sort of the 10th house for occupation, rank, and career, the MC, medium quelli. And the, the fourth house, for instance, became the thing of the hidden matters and home death, parents' home death, and the hidden things that are hidden on the earth, so to speak, sometimes treasures as well, because uh, the sun traveling. There was uh, the sun traveling at that time, you could not see it, you could, yeah, it was uh, so to speak under the earth. So, yeah, things based on what you can see visually that was the mainly Mesopotamian thing and Hellenistic, perhaps, yeah. Uh, where are we now? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, so, so here, anyway, the philosophy of Hellenistic astrology. Uh, so the three main things, Stoicism, Platonism, Neoplatonism, and Aristotelianism. These were the three main sort of currents, and Hermeticism, of course, as well. The main philosophical currents that influenced astrology, or perhaps astrology influenced them as well. So, Back and forth. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> uh, 
Tisha, the Greek uh, word for fortune, providence, and fate. Also chance should be noted. And the same in Latin, so fortuna, chance, luck, fate, and fortune. And personified fortuna, the goddess of fate, luck, or fortune. And chance, because uh, even in chance, for instance, in, there was seen to be some sort of working of a divinity. If you, we will see that with the lots later. The lots were sort of uh, the literal meaning for uh, casting lots today, lottery. So this is also, as Chris Brenner mentioned in his book, the, sort of uh, this exists even in the Bible, New Testament, when the uh, uh, a new apostle has to be chosen after Judas had to hang him so and betray them. <clears throat> and then they, they cast lots. You know. So casting lots was like sort of uh, uh, something considered uh, where the yeah, divinity was in work as well. And uh, yeah, but uh, uh, yes, so what I wanted to say here was. Uh, Signs. These were the two main things. This is very important. <clears throat> so this is. Um... Oh, sorry. Yes, Amanda needs to leave by fourteen. Yes, sure. Uh. Uh, sorry for <laughs> talking too much here, but of the uh, I have uh, prepared too much. I think, but we can. It's all right. Anyway. So, signs and causes. <laughs> so either either the uh, the planets and constellations were um, causing events, or they were signifying events uh, upon Earth. So, and the astrologers had different views upon this, and the philosophers as well. And uh, Ptolemy, for instance, is more towards the causes. I think that his valence is a bit more towards sign signifying. If I'm not mistaken now. Uh, yeah. This is, this is adapted from Chris Brennan's book. So I've borrowed quite a bit here from him as a, because I have, but I have references for it in the end. So, but he kind of has monopoly on this because he's written so much, so much of valuable things about this. So anyway. And between the signs and causes, there was this notion of determinism. So either, either like there is fate is hundred percent determined beforehand, or you can change fate. So this is like a philosophical concept. Some believe that there were complete determinism that no nothing could be changed at all, and some thought there was partial determinism that there were things that were determined, but there were other things that you could change. So I think Ptolemy as well was sort of in partial determinism because he. He mentions that to, you can make talismans and stuff like that to hinder some astral influences. But I, I believe that the main difference for this determinism, at least, when it comes to determinism, it has to do with the, like the, the even more important topic of the true nature of the human being, like the soul and the different different parts of the soul. Because there, there were different, uh, I'd, there, were a, there was a concept of the, having the, there was a concept of the soul being, having a more, more divine part and a more sort of animal part. Yeah. So it's quite complicated, but you know, it's different ideas. I wanted to say also that, um, before we continue to sect, which is important as well. Uh, yeah, Ptolemy, or like uh, astrology itself, or what it's dealt with was often called katarche, or an ap apotelisma. So inception, beginning, or like, yeah, and apotelisma was outcome, result, completion. 
So that's Chris Brennan mentions in the first by Schmidt, another uh, scholar. An important online principle in theological practice was the alignment of the cosmos of the inception of something is connected to its outcome. So like the ascendant at the inception is connected to the outcome. The ascendant of the person is connected to the apotelisma, the outcome of a person's life. And apotelisma means full completion, event, result in the in Greek, ancient Greek dictionary. Astrologically, a result of certain positions of the stars and human destiny. Uh, but I would say that because uh, Ptolemy has, has a work called Apotelismatica, his Tetra Biblos. So I would say that it's, you could literally, what he really means, I think, is, according to me, is the effects. So the effects of the stars, especially Ptolemy, I think, would mean that. Apotelismat, the the effects from the stars causing things. So what he was studying was the effects upon Earth, the uh, effects upon people, especially with his four elements system, which he had. Uh, yeah. Because Ptolemy had uh, this, this sort of Aristotelian notion of uh, the four elements, uh, they affect that the planets affect these elements, but the planets themselves are not necessarily composed of the elements, but because of the planets, the four elements upon Earth are sort of uh, uh, affected yeah, to do their workings upon us and upon everything. Uh, so, for instance, Mars <clears throat> excessively hot and dry, and the Saturn was excessively cold and dry. So you had the, idea, the four elements of hot, Hot, or fire, air, water, and earth, as you know, and then uh, there was connected to that from Aristotle and Plato and all this uh, fire, air, water. No, the hot, the dry, the cold, and the wet. Yeah. So Ptolemy was kind of making astrology into natural science. And he, he was, it has been found that he was kind of peculiar because he was the most. He, important astrology up until the Renaissance, so or, um, perhaps later as well, but uh, he was uh, he was the most well-read, but because of, he wrote an astronomical work, which, which was very important as well, so uh, but his astrological work was the most well-read because it was one of the few translated, I think. And uh, But when they found like the, these other texts, and especially during the last 20 years with the Project Hindsight, when they were translating these Greek texts, Vettius Valens, Rhetorius, and everyone else, they found that Ptolemy was kind of peculiar. His, he was sort of, he had the different viewpoints compared to the other ones, to the rest of the astrologers, because he was quite Aristotelian in his way, like, uh, yeah, causalistic. Uh, yes, but it's unclear if he drew, drew from earlier sources or if he like came up with this himself. But yeah, I believe he. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> so Plotinus was another important philosopher, but he sort of believed in astrology, but not in, in that it caused things. Literally, he said, for instance, writing in the third century after Christ, if stars caused events, then birds would cause them too. Because uh, <clears throat> augurs and soothsayers would look at birds and other phenomena. So he said, if, if since uh, you can divine things by birds, you do not say that they cause these things. You only say that they signify them. Then you say it's the same, it's the same thing for the, planet, for the stars and planets, that they only signify. <clears throat> but he was an important uh, <clears throat> philosopher, generally, Neoplatonist. And for Stoicism, it was Zeno of Kitu, around the... Uh, 300, 300 before Christ, he founded the uh, Stoicism. So coincided with the yeah, Hellenistic astrology and uh, especially uh, the Romans uh, were fond of Stoicism. And a fundamental, a fundamental principle in that philosophy was all happens according to a predetermined provident, providential divine plan. So everything is sort of being played out from a divine plan, which is already ordered, but it was a bit more complex of that. It wasn't like 
Oh, they had, they had Proclus later writing this 400 after Christ around it. He, he, he explained this like notion of determined fate, but uh, and uh, he said that there is sort of a free will as well, but uh, it's a bit more complicated. So we won't, we won't go into details now. So the Imarmen, uh, for instance, was another name for fate. It was kind of technical name for fate, I think, in aromatic texts, um, for the fate coming from the planets. Well, let's continue now. Uh, sect, an important thing. <clears throat> Do you all know about sect? <clears throat> Have you heard about this? So anyway, it's... Uh, Yeah, it's, it has to do with day and night charts. So, the seven planets, because the seven planets were the main planets studied during Atlantic astrology. The seven planets you can see with your eye, even today. Yeah, and uh, they were divided into benefics and malefics. The good planets, so to speak, not good, but and the evil, evil or bad planets. Well, they're the thing, the planets that were signifying bad things. Not necessarily being bad or something. Uh, so, yes. And the sect alters the way the benefics and malefics function in the chart. So, and the leader of the diurnal is the sect, the day sect is the sun, and the leader of the nocturnal is the moon. Mercury is kind of uh, ambival ambivalent here. But, uh, uh, yeah, so for the day sect, you have Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter is the benefic of the day sect. Saturn is the malefic. And then you have, uh, for the uh, night nocturnal sect, we have Venus as the benefic, the most positive, and Mars as the malefic. For Mer yeah. And the, here you have sort of a, a chart of like how they conceptualize this. So in the day, you had the most positive planet was a Jupiter. Because Jupiter was naturally of the day sect. And then uh, Saturn, which was naturally of the day sect, when it was configured good in a day sect, it could be quite good things. Because it was a, yeah, good signification. So, <clears throat> but the most negative then during the day was Mars, because his normal sect is night. So he doesn't like being in the day, so to speak, or <laughs> whatever he signifies in the day. If it, if it is badly configured, badly aspects or bad place, domicile or whatever, then it uh, can be quite negative for the native. And then Venus, of course, as you see, uh, which is of the night sect, uh, is a benefic, but it, it is not as positive as Jupiter. Then, and then if we turn to night chart, we have the most positive, it's the opposite. Venus is the most positive. And the most negative will be Saturn, because again they are of the day chart and they like to be in the night chart, so to speak. Okay. <laughs> they prefer the night chart, no, the day chart. Uh, yes, Mercury is kind of ambivalent. So, uh, basically, he was diurnal as a morning star. If if he, if he rose before the sun, then he became diurnal of the day sector. But if he rose before off after the nocturnal, yeah, it became an evening star if he rose after the sun, like behind it in the in the zodiac. Yeah. Mercury always ambivalent. Mercury was always taking on the significations of things next to him or aspects and planets and <laughs> signs. So, uh, dwelling a bit on the planets, then. Uh, so, when you, when you take when you combine the planets with sect, you <clears throat> it can give the how do you say the most like the extreme examples would be like for Mars during the day can become hatred for Venus during the night because she likes the night love for Jupiter during the day 
freedom for Saturn during the night would be like imprisonment. Venus, positive influences or positive, uh, when she's go, uh, beneficially placed uh, acquisition of property, Mars, when he's badly placed, taking away of possessions. Jupiter, good, well-placed wisdom, Saturn, badly placed ignorance. Jupiter, children and childbirth, Mars, abortion, Saturn, barrenness. Venus marriage, Saturn unmarried, widowed. Venus friendship, Jupiter alliances, Mars war and separation of friends, of course. So yeah, so Valence has a good, uh, he has a good metaphor on this, which I like because I paint also. So if you paint, this is a really nice metaphor. Uh, since Jupiter and Venus appear bright in the night sky, uh, while Mars are dark and red, and Saturn is dark and brown. <clears throat> they they were they were connected to like colors or like the light spectrum of like lighter colors and darker colors they were even called like the uh, sparkling the, the twinkling wonders and stuff like that Phaethon was i think it was jupiter Phaethon, shining one or something <clears throat> um yeah anyway <clears throat> and, and that, uh, valence mentions <clears throat> Uh, sorry, one second. Uh, Val Valence mentions in the book six, he has the, as we see, the color metaphor. The quality of the stars compared to the painter's colors. The malefics seem more active, meaning effective, than benefics, because due to the dark colors staining the more light colors. And he says, he makes the comparison with when you paint, you have like, if you put I know this for a fact, this is so true. When, when you put like a dark, just a bit, a little bit of blue or brown or whatever, on a more light palette, then it immediately becomes like stained with a dark color. So you have to put just a very little bit, otherwise it becomes like everything becomes darker. And the same with a red color. It's like, it just takes over completely. So, uh, yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's quite a telling. I mean, because uh, the the malefics were always in their delineations were like uh, how do you say they were affecting in a quite bad manner. Often it could become yeah, they were just um, stirring up the whole configuration into the a worse manner if it was badly placed and. Yeah, really uh, showing their activity, so to speak. And yeah, so this is a great metaphor for that to remember and to have in mind. Uh, and the ascendant now was uh, quite important as well, almost uh, almost more important than the sun sign in some respects. Yeah. Uh, it was called, called Damas, a lord of the R marker for the ruler of the ascendant. Oh no, the yeah. So the place of the R ruler of the ascendant uh, shows major topics of Nadia's life, the focus and direction, the sign itself, and the ruler of it. For instance, uh, Virgo and the ruler would be Mercury. Wherever Mercury is placed is very important, or like quite important for the native. So the first house significations were, for instance, life, body, spirit, inception, beginning. Because one uh, one idea about this was that the the soul, one second, the soul uh, entered from uh, the soul entered from the ascendant in the eastern part of the sky at birth. That was, I think, one of the Neoplatonists wrote that. Yeah. So, sort of like that. So the eastern part of the sky was very important. And of course, because the sun rises there, the ecliptic, or <clears throat> the sun and all the rest of the planets. So, yeah. Many important things about it. And uh, connected to that, the uh, the angles, the 10th, the 4th, and the 7th. Everything all often connected to the visual view of the ecliptic where the sun travels on the 12th 
zodiacs and the, the the all the rest of the planets. So Valens says then, uh, for every nativity after the stars have been accurately charted, it will be necessary to examine how the Dharma and Lord is configured, which stars it has witnessing it, whether it is rising and setting, meaning on the beams, and whether it on the beams of the sun, and whether it has a familiar or foreign relation to the sect. Yeah, so he's talking about the ruler of the ascendant. Just everything you can notice about the aspects in the domicile and the house. And, and then there is this uh, sort of uh, there's this idea of uh, because it was called the helm. Uh, every, side, every house had a specific name and the first house was called the uh, the helm, oyax, oyax, handle of a rudder, meaning handle of rudder, tiller, or generally helm. Now, in the English dictionary, the rudder is an underwater blade that is positioned at the stern of a boat or ship <clears throat> and controlled by its helm. And that's when turned, that when you turn it, causes the vessel's head to turn in the same direction. So the rudder is an underwater blade under the boat, because th there might have been this kind of metaphor with a ship person being sort of a ship or in his entire life. And then the uh, yeah, the underwater blade would be the rudder, and the handle of the rudder, the helm, would be the ascendant, so to speak, or the ruler of the ascendant, which sort of turns the entire boat. So, yeah. The leader of the life. So, and then, then you have also the technique from the master nativity, but that's quite it is quite complex in reality, I think, to figure that out because, you know, okay. it's one of the sort of mysteries of the chart. So, 12 signs. Uh, this picture is in the astrologydictionary.com. And that was also, I looked up the author for this picture on the right. It's like an open source uh, dictionary.com, and it's Chris Brennan as well. <laughs> He's everywhere. He's got monopoly on this, so, but yeah, oh, it's great. It's um, uh, it does a good side as well. It gives you short information on everything, basically. Uh, so the, this twelve signs is kind of similar, sort of similar things, but there are some different things from modern astrology. You have, uh, uh, yeah, four different things, four important things: planetary rulership, gender. Masculine and feminine, then you have and you have triplicity element, and then you have quadruplicity. The move there, the quadruplicity is called um, sort of movable, fixed, and double bodied for uh, the cardinal and fixed and mutable. I think it's in modern astrology, you have to correct me, please, if I say something wrong. Uh, yeah, so movable are the uh, the crab and the <clears throat> Aries and. Uh, Libra, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Capricorn. Movable, and etc. So, yeah, planetary rulership, then, which is based on Thema Mundi. And uh, I think you all know about that already. But for instance, the Venus in Taurus is domicile. Mars in Aries is domicile. Saturn in Aquarius. Uh, gender <clears throat> is, of course, the positive, negative, the masculine, feminine, the masculine would be uh, starting with Aries, masculine, <clears throat> Taurus, feminine, Yemeni, masculine, Kanker, Cancer would be feminine, Leo, masculine, etc., etc. So, uh, and masculine, feminine is quite important, actually, for the sun and moon, at least in Rhetorius, I've read. Probably for the others as well. So Rhetorius says, for instance, that if the sun, for a male child, for a male person, if the sun is like a male sign, Aries or something, or and the moon is in the feminine sign, like in the crab, then it, then it's he's quite balanced person because there was this belief of masculine and feminine polarities in the soul, in the person. So, but yeah. So then the he said if, if it both were feminine signs, the person would be more towards like the 
feminine side, if it was masculine side, if, it were, if both planets, the sun and sun were masculine signs, the sun and moon were in the masculine signs, then he would be quite a bold person and like, like warlike person and stuff like that. Quite the same for for female charts, but for female charts, they consider the best if the uh, moon and the sun was both in feminine signs. But yeah, but they had they showed the different things. I mean that persons could be could have these polarities within themselves. That was commonly known. I mean to the astrologers, it wasn't like a new thing that oh some people are more feminine or more masculine like it was it was quite well known so <clears throat> tri triplicity and element was also important uh of course which is uh we'll get to that later as well but yeah you there are four elements and the uh yeah the the aspects yeah what was it about the aspects now yes as we see here on the picture, we have squares on the back. Yeah, so this is like sort of the... Yeah, to the benefics, you would have the, for instance, the Jupiter from the sun. If you look at from the sun and moon, from Jupiter, we have the trines. Trine to Sagittarius and trine to Pisces. And uh, the sort of more positive uh, aspects, so to speak, but uh, some often more neutral, but positive as well. And then for the squares are to Mars from the Sun and Moon. <coughs> Sextiles also positive are to the Venus, and then you have uh, oppositions to Saturn. So the the two malefics have the sort of uh, tough aspects and the two benefics have the sort of positive aspects. That's interesting as well, like in the rationale of the entire thing. Thema Mundi. So, by the way, how much time do you have today? You who are left, can I ask, ask you? We're about halfway through, but I, I will go quite fast now. So, how much time do you have right now? I still have time today. Sorry? I I still have um time today. It's just Sunday. I mean, I have work, but I can I can do my work. Yes. Later. So I, have, I have about twenty twenty five minutes. I think if I want to go through everything. So. Okay. So just so you know, so yeah, uh, Thema Monday. Quite important as well. <laughs> it's all important, but <clears throat> it's a nice picture. It's supposed to be, but yeah, the. Neoplatonic female uh, uh, philosopher of the fifth century after Christ, who was <laughs> said to have been murdered by a Christian mob. Uh, um, yeah, because she was quite uh, one of one of, like in the end of sort of late antiquity, the Christians became some of the Christian sects became fanatic and. Against philosophy and against astrology and everything. Astrological books were burned and they were, some were like killed, some were, yeah, there were basically persecutions. That's good to remember. We live in quite good times for astrology. <laughs> Not so persecuted now, so, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so the Femme Mundi was sort of the, uh, b b birth chart of the world, which uh, Firmicus Maternus, a Latin astrologer, has uh, has it in his book. I think some else. Uh, yeah. So, so here you see like the birth chart of the world. That's where the ascendant uh, is in the crab. And the, all the planets in their domiciles. And the second house is uh, Leo, the sun there, and then Virgo, and then Libra, and Scorpio, Sagittarius, and Capricorn. Uh, so this was kind of, it's un unclear, but 
Sorry. Sorry, I didn't notice. I wasn't unmuted. I'm really sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. I didn't hear anything. It was just. Sorry. I'm making a cup of tea, so it was probably <laughs> loud. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Uh, so this is. Uh, 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 it was it was kind of used for practice. I mean, <laughs> by the astrologers, this Thema Mundi, this chart, birth chart of the world, birth chart, birth chart of the gods, sometimes. Called, but so uh, yeah, so it was uh, sort of. I think it wasn't perhaps literally believed that this was the earth chart of the world, but uh, there were many significant concepts connected with this, for instance, but also to the astrology, Babylonian astrology, this sort of set of int introduced astrology to the Greeks. It was, they said, the, the Chaldean who introduced the, the conjunction of all planets in uh, the crab. You can't get it uh, when all the planets are conjunct in the, the crab, there will be a destruction of the world by fire, and when conjunct in Capricorn, there will be destruction by floods. So, probably based on the like when the sun is in the crab, we know that's sort of the hottest part of the year, so then like fire, and then when it's the sun is in Capricorn, it's like winter and like cold, and it's destruction of floods, but. Uh, that's probably the reason for that, but uh, yeah, these uh, doctrines have, I think, great antiquity. So it's like it's unclear exactly what to, it's unclear to what extent we can understand everything, uh, how much, how much we have understood. But there, there's a lot to gain from the Thema Mundi to study it. It's very interesting. So Plato and Timaeus says. Uh, for instance, the climacterial years when the eight periods have reached the fulfillment. <clears throat> eight periods probably connected to the seven planets and the firmament. So, in, in Proclus, Neoplatonic uh, philosopher says, in the commentary to the Timaeus, the length of the great years determined by conjunctions in, in the crab. It's not exactly what it says, but there's a para uh, paraphrase. Yeah, vast intervals, so greater and lesser periods within this. And Thorndike, a uh, classical scholar or a scholar of history, is uh, has connected this, said that this is the astrological doctrine of the Magnus Annus, the great year. Uh, probably the 25,772 solar years, but it might be something, meant something else as well. Uh, connected the procession of the equinoxes. When the equinoxes have uh, well, the procession when the procession has been made like for 12 signs the complete cycle is finished and that's 25,772 solar years <clears throat> so a lot of information a lot of information numbers here but it's uh yeah. they had they had their concepts about these things it's like these great years which uh, the 12 houses then shortly so Won't go into details and everything. I'll just shortly mention these things now. So, uh, for the twelve houses, as said, the angles were very important, especially when determining like the outcome of the life and stuff like that, and zodiacal and the time lord periods. Uh, <clears throat> the four astronomical points would be connected to the angles, and then the sun, the planets rising at the ascendant, eastern rising every day. Midheaven uh, said the highest point of the ecliptic. The setting is where all planets sink out of sight. The western horizon, uh, the seventh house, when you no longer see the planets during the, the day. And the subterranean place, as we can see the names here also of the of the houses, the subterraneous place is quite, quite literal, like under the heaven, uh, under the earth. Where the planets are most hidden. Yes. Uh, so, what was it about this now? Well, uh, anyway, so, uh, yeah, here are some of the simplifications then. And we see also the planetary joys or the 
where the planets rejoice, so to speak. Mercury in the first, uh, Moon in third, Venus fifth, uh, Mars in sixth, Sun in ninth, Jupiter eleventh, and Saturn in twelfth. Um, yeah. So this is like, I think for all astrologers, this is really good to go like go back to the sort of roots and like always have this at in the back of the head when you're looking at like the sciences, the whole science. The beginning like this as a foundation is really good. So for the first house, I said life, body, spirit, inception. The second house was called gate of Hades, Hades. livelihood and possessions. The third was called the goddess. And then there was a connection uh, with the opposite house. So the ninth is called uh, God. The second was Gate of Hades, and the eighth was inactive, so it was place of death, and also the place of inheritance, so money. Both of them were sort of connected to money as well. And the third, yeah, siblings. So there was siblings living abroad, or the queen, or the parents of the fifth were children. Six was slaves, injuries, sickness, enemies, and often like work, which is like Slavic, Slavic, or no, not Slavic, but uh, sl slavery type of work uh, is often like in the sixth house, in the twelfth house. It's like work, which is just never ending, sort of. Uh, yeah, and the sixth and twelfth have a connection. The bad fortune, the sixth, the bad spirit, twelfth. Bad spirit is often for like mental mental negative things connected to mental but also positive things if it's configured in a good way <laughs> and the tenth of course reputation and stuff like that fourth parents and the good pretty good houses then in the fifth and the eleventh good fortune and good spirit and the seventh of course setting marriage spouse living abroad and stuff like that uh configurations then uh they are again a bit short here now there's a lot of we can talk about this but too much i think so uh anyway uh, so one important thing about the configurations and how they uh visualize this was as said there are there optical theories planets ascending and emitting rays so There was this kind of idea that the eyes, uh, among the philosophers, there was the idea that the eyes would send or emit rays or like connected to the soul, probably. And, uh, and the, the same was then for the planets, like for objects everywhere, that they could either send or emit rays. And then, especially bright objects like the sun, and the moon, and the stars and planets. So, so when there's, for instance, a square. As we see, the hexagon was called the hexagon out of a geometrical figure. No, sorry, not the hexagon, the tetragon, the square. Four signs of parts, 90 degrees. Then they would say that one planet is sort of looking at the other planet in 90 degrees, like staring at it. Or like, when it's opposite, it would literally like stare at the other planet, and that would be like a, a bad influence or something. So, <laughs> yeah. So this vision, those things, this thing about sending rays was important in the aspects. So there were sign-based aspects and there were degree-based aspects, also important. <laughs> Difference from uh, <clears throat> later astrology. Uh, even if the planets weren't configured by sign, they, they would be configured by, no, even if they weren't de configured by degree, they would be configured by sign. So even if it, were, if it wasn't like, 15 degrees square between each planet. It was still, it could be like, it could be by the sign. And the one important aspect that is like sort of influencing strongly is uh, upon the 10th of dominating or recovering. It was, it's like um, when a planet is, if you have a planet in the first house, for instance, and then you count from the first house in the zodiacal. Um, order you would get to the 10th house and if there is another planet at that 10th house that planet will be dominating the planet at the first house so that was a, it would be like 
its influence was would be more stronger than any other planet. Sort of, uh, and then the containment, for instance, when two planets or two rays were containing another planet, and then the aspects themselves, uh, hexagon. They 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 consider them as sort of the geometrical figures. So the sextile, sixty degrees for us. This, now this is also important in, in Greek mathematics as well, because we today are, look at mathematics more like algebraic, like with the uh, formulas and stuff, but they made a distinction between that. When it was geometry, it was geometry, like, and we, we would look at it visually. So we would consider geometry visually, not with algebra. So a sextile was a hexagon, a square was a tetragon, or literally a square, and a tri, triangle was a trigon. A triangle. The diameter was opposition, so that was kind of half a circle or something. Sort of visualized like that, yeah. And triplicity rules is sec light. I say that everything here is important, but this is especially important, so uh, for Hellenistic astrology, because it's it has to do with the timing techniques and the the general outcome of the life of the individual, yeah, like predicting the events that will happen. Uh, so they are the principles and rules of the sect light, as they're called, are for broad and general statements of the native's life. Uh, so look at one thing here. So what was it about this? Uh, For instance, then, okay, so we see there uh, the difference here between uh, the quadruplicities from, yeah, anyway, the difference between the, how we determine them by the four elements is that for the for this technique, because the rules of the sect light, they had the specific rulers, planetary rulers for each of the quadruplicities. So for the fiery one, it's called quadruplicities, yeah? It's not triplicities, yeah? <laughs> I mix them up. Yeah, you can stop me if I say something wrong. So, yeah, the quadruplicities. Um, the ruler, for instance, of the fiery one would be, for the day, it would be the sun. For the night, it would be Jupiter. And the cooperating ruler would be Saturn. Yeah. And for Earth, for the day, it would be the Venus. For night, the moon. The cooperating would be Mars. And then the opposite, if it was a day night chart when the sun is below uh yeah, below the horizon and the uh, second half of the hemisphere, so to speak. Uh it would be night a night chart and then <clears throat> yeah, so yeah, the thing is that you look at uh, what you first would look at is where, if it's a day chart, you look where the sun is. If it's a night chart, you look at where the moon is. So if it's a day chart and the sun is located at Leo, then you know that this is of the fire triplicity and the ruler of the first part of the life would be the sun and whatever sign he is in. And the ruler of the second part would be Jupiter. And the cooperating of both of them, like, would be Saturn, cooperating in the aspects and stuff like that. Yeah, so that's the basic gist of that. So, but there's not much more to go into. And then the lots. Uh, we call it clearly. Uh, yeah. Is everyone with me still? Sorry for this long time. Hello? I'm still here. <laughs> Everyone seems to be here. Han, are you here? Han is not responding. But uh, I actually have to quickly go to the bathroom. Uh, okay. Just to, okay. Is it okay if I just go quickly to the bathroom and we can take a like, five-minute break? Absolutely. So uh, anyone who wants to continue can continue. And uh, I'll be here for... Sorry, I said 20 minutes, but now I think it will be like 
15 minutes from now, but uh, or from when I get back. So just quickly, I will pause this, okay? And then... No problem. Sorry, so I'll quickly be back. Okay, sorry, I'm back now. Uh, I'm on that to leave. Okay, it's thank you for staying, uh, listening. I don't know if Anne is left, but anyway, Bonnie, you're left. I'm here. <laughs> Good. Uh, I mean, you are still here. Uh, so yeah, now we're getting to the end of all this. So, um. Uh, Mm. Lots, okay, so again, the lots called clearly in Greek, so uh, so this idea of the, there's a seemingly random act where divinity is actually present, like casting uh, dice or casting lots. Leaving the outcome to chance, <clears throat> Tycha, again, Tycha, like personified as a goddess, and like, uh, it can literally mean chance. So that's quite interesting. But also fortune and, yeah, fate. Uh, I don't exactly fate, but yeah. No, fate as well. Anyway. Um, So the lots are sort of the unpredictable, considered the unpredictable things, but uh, I mean, the meaning of lots, but uh, 
but compared to the uh, point of the ascendant, the lots were sort of more personal and treated such, especially by Valence. Uh, so you had the ascendant would be like, where you could say general statements for all nativities, but like for the where the lots were configured, it would be much more specific for the native himself or herself. But, yeah. Uh, so the two important ones, as you already cert certainly know about, probably is the lot of fortune, a lot of spirit. Uh, a lot of fortunes calculated by the day chart counting from the solar degree to the lunar degree, and then the same distance from the ascendant. In the night, the opposite, counting from the moon to the sun, and the same distance from the sun. So for, a lot of fortune was uh, connected to the body, <coughs> often to the moon, <coughs> for the moon had a signification of uh, the body often. We didn't go through some of the signification of the planets, but we can do that as well, just quickly. Uh, there's, for instance, uh, but anyway, first let's talk about this lot of spirit. So that's more of like with this connected to the sun, the soul, the intellect, discourse, giving and receiving, as Valence says. Then you have a lot of eros, a lot of love, and a lot of necessity. And uh, uh, for Valens, a lot of base is, is important, like a lot of exaltation connected to the other lots and the uh, other planets would be important. So just quickly about the planets, because this is also important. The, the sun, for instance, Valens says, says the all-seeing sun consisting of fiery and intelligent light, the instrument of perception of the soul. <clears throat> In nativity signifies kinship, authority, mind, intelligence, form, motion, height of fortune. Dealing with the gods, judgment, being engaged in public affairs. <clears throat> Leadership of crowds, father, master, friendship, notable figures, etc., etc. So the sun rules the head of the sense organs. The right eye of the, of the torso rules the heart. Life, breath, life, breath, and the nerves. <clears throat> of substance as it rules gold. <clears throat> so... The things about the thing about the significations could be sometimes uh, very literate or very uh, exaggerated, but that was often on purpose. So, like Mars could be really showing that death would be imminent, or like, I mean, wars and stuff like that, but not often. So the the delineations, their texts are quite literal and quite. Uh, uh, yeah, what did I say? No, literal and uh, exaggerated, but that was on purpose often to show a point of the, the different uh, polarities in the world, so to speak, and then how you can mix them together. The different extremes and how they are mixed together. So, okay, the moon, for instance, Valen says, the moon is born from reflection of the soul light, possessing counterfeit light. Signifies an activity of man's physical life, often the body. And the mother, the conception, appearance, the goddess, living together, lawful marriage, nurse, all the siblings, etc., etc., queen, you know, Saturn, <clears throat> makes those born on him petty. Saturn is called the shining one, the final. And they, they make, says a lot of negative things about it. So, makes those born on him petty, malicious, having many anxieties, those who bring themselves down, solitary, deceitful. Etc. Etc. Et but some of the positive ones things are mm -hmm. makes farmers and gardeners and uh, in a nymph house is quite positive and uh, for intellectual endeavors and uh, he produces those who cry great reputation notable rank guardianships. Jupiter the star Jupiter thing has the big idea of children childbirth desire love alliances knowledge friendship with the great abundance. Uh, Mars, malefic, it signifies violence, wars, robbery, screens, insolence, adultery, taking away one's possessions, banishment, exile, estrangement, captivity, and uh, yeah. abortions, thefts, robbery, anger, fighting, abuse, hatred, lawsuits, tax. And I mean, yeah, but it can also mean like strong, energetic people and warlike people. People who work with their hands and masons and high-ranking officers, 
sovereignty. <coughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah. So it's important to mention these so-called negative things because that's sometimes left out in modern astrology that we have to be honest about uh, how the world looks like. And it's, it's consists of both good and evil persons and good and evil things. So, and that's quite uh, obvious in Hellenistic astrology. Venus I agree that it's Valen good. Desire and love, oh. The light bringer, the phosphorus. And signifies mother and nurse. <clears throat> she makes priesthoods public benefit, often religion, Venus. Priesthoods public benefactors, wearing of golden ornaments, the wearing of crowns, merriment, friendships, companionship, acquisition of additional property, <coughs> purchasing of ornaments, purchasing ornaments, and uh, refined arts, uh, sweet singing, beauty of form, painting, mixing of colors, purple dye. Yeah. Both the inventors and also the masters of these. Hermer is the twinkling one, uh, Hermes, Mercury. But the uh, star market is education, writings, disputation, speech, brotherhood, interpretation, numbers, calculation, geometry. Yeah. So he's the, the persona of critical thinking and judgment. Properly speaking, he makes temple builders, models, sculptors, doctors, teachers. Man. He makes many things, Mercury. For this, Rather uh, says, this star holds the power of many pursuits, uh, granting occupations in accordance with the variations of the zodiacal signs. Yeah. Yeah, so just a really <laughs> quick rundown. If I'm speaking too fast, tell me. So it's just, I don't want to dwell too long on these things now. So, okay, we're getting to the end now. So the zodiacal release in part, uh, timing techniques. Chrono Chronocato, the Time Lord, was quite in, uh, was the, sort of uh, the main significator of these things. Chronocrator meaning Time Lord, which was like the planet, the planetary lord over a specific period or specific sign. Um, so what you were doing with these time techniques, so what you are, we, we can do is that we divide the life into book, a book sort of chapters and subsections. And here's where like also the ethical things come to mind. How much do you tell the native? How much do you? How much do you actually sign? How much is actually signified and like? How much is predetermined by fate? Like you, it's now you. Violence causes this one of the most powerful techniques, and this is the one which he through much labor, so to speak, he recovered in Egypt around the second century after Christ. So we have to give credit to him, of course, as Chris Brenner also says in his course, we have to give credit to our teachers, so to speak. Uh, yes, so this, 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 it's an idea that uh, not all placements are activated at the same time in the chart. And some placements are activated activated at some specific times. So, quite similar to the Indian Dasha system, which is today, which still exists today. And uh, yeah, as I said, this technique was, was uh, recovered in Western astrology very recently when the Greek texts were translated. The past twenty years. Are you talking now. about the fadas? So the annual perfections are for. Quite uh, straightforward. You can you hear me? <laughs> you have one year for each sign activated, and then it changes. So for the first sign, when the, the native is born, you have the first sign being activated on the time lord for that sign. Yes. And the time lord, for instance, if it was uh, in, in the crab, and the time lord would be the moon, and then would you look? You would look wherever the moon is uh, configured in the chart and like the transits and stuff like that that would be very important for that year and then uh, so in zodiacal order of counterclockwise you just continue on with that for each year each sign each house each year <laughs> looking at the rulers <clears throat> and then zodiacal releasing is where you have the two lots as starting points a lot of fortune a lot of uh, spirit so when you look at matters concerning body again and handicraft often bodily work or work itself you look at a lot of fortune 
when you look at uh, sort of career and stuff like that and soul and intellect and discourse, you, you look at a so lot of spirit, you begin from there. And the connection to this, you have the planetary periods. So the planetary periods were astronomical periods. You had many different sort of periods, but for zodiacal releasing, it's <clears throat> the moon has 25 years. I call it the sun, 19 years, Mercury, 20, Venus, 8 years, Mars, 15, Jupiter, 12, and Capricorn, 27, and Aquarius, 30. So <clears throat> these periods are connected to the signs which they return to like after in connection to the sun <clears throat> the metonic cycles for instance yeah and did you have a question or um, you say you're talking about yeah, so can hear. in connection to this you have the periods and sub periods so you have you divide a life into years months weeks and days and uh, connected to the planetary periods. And so, for instance, again, if you have the crab, a lot of fortune in the crab, then you have 25 years for the crab. It would be important. And then you, you can subdivide that as well to months, weeks, and or if you have Jupiter, which is a shorter period, you have 12 years. A lot of spirit in Jupiter, for instance, you begin with 12 years in. Sagittarius, for instance, and then Venus, eight years. Yeah, but the thing is, you begin with a lot where a lot of spirit is, and you continue counterclockwise <coughs> the zodiacal order. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm speaking too much now. So. Whenever you have questions, just stop me. <clears throat> so I'm going to get to some example charts, and then we're finished. <coughs> um. <clears throat> Some important analytic astrologies, and I mentioned some of them already. I'm talking, but you can't hear me. Uh, Bonnie. Uh, is it Bonnie? Is it something you have to you have a question or something? I can't hear Anne, no. Can't hear at all. Can you hear me now? I don't know if it's, she's still here. Can you hear us? But you are still okay. Anyway, Anne is here. Okay, great. Hi, I can. Can you hear me now? So we'll get into that now. I uh, can so, hear you, Anne. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I, I have to uh, go away, but I'm back. Start with the semi mythical Hermestris Mason. I don't Sostipio, think we can hear us though. Abraham. So these are kind of famous names, like in philosophy, but uh, semi mythical because they might have lived or not. I mean, most of them probably lived, but they were considered as mythical figures and like in this sort of type of idea of a tradition <clears throat> of teacher and student. You had, for instance, Hermes Trismastos as a great teacher who would sort of transcend the time and like would always be the, the teacher for priests, for instance. The same with Asclepios, the teacher of, for uh, in medicine and stuff like that. So these names were sort of connected to these sort of tra mystery traditions and like this notion that a great teacher could be called a Hermes. A great teacher could be called a Zoroaster. Stuff like that. That's why they were... There was... Uh, why this is important, because it, there's so many... As you call pseudo-texts written. People who claim to be Hermes, for instance, I mean, writing anonymously. Uh, people who claim to be Zoroaster in, like, during you know, a period of 2,000 years. <laughs> so it's like... Oh, you lived a long time. <laughs> but it's probably different people writing with the same name. Somebody writes something, wrote something there. No, I can't hear you, no. I don't know why, but... Uh... Are you hear me now? Oh, sorry. I had closed my... Uh, yes, I can hear you now. 
Okay, because I tried to speak before, but um, you yes. didn't hear me. Yeah. I'm sorry, I had closed my. No yeah. problem. Very, very uh, uh, impressed by this uh, presentation, and there's it's so big. The area is so big. You have so many thousand years here <laughs> to yeah. cover. I mean, and and it's it's a very interesting <laughs> subject. I I don't think that. I mean, I mean, it's it's really nice that of you that to make this presentation for Naya and to to we can learn and 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 listen to these kind of different views of astrology and also the history how broad it is. It's really fascinating, I think. And this is area I don't I don't know so much about traditional Hellenistic like techniques, so I don't like want to go into them so much because I don't know. Uh, but just this history, I mean, that's for everyone. That's that's the history of Western astrology. So it's, we should know that, all of us, that, that does astrology, I think. Now, thank you very much for this material. It's, it's great, really. Yes, you're very welcome. It's um, um, I kind of focused over half of it on the, the techniques, but because... It was a misunderstanding there in the beginning what I what I was going to do, but yeah, I, I could have focused only on the history, but um, yeah, I was supposed to focus now also on techniques a bit, just a rundown. Yeah, but, and uh, it's one it's because we, so we're, we're recording this anyway, so it's like for the future. So <clears throat> yeah, absolute, and and I I don't know the techniques, so for me it was like it's very good to get to know how what different techniques you have and what what how do you use them because that's that's uh, important and also but also this history is so broad it's a, such a broad area and it's not easy to to summarize it like this it's very hard to get a summary like you did i think of a, a very broad subject so thank you very much this is very helpful to learn to learn more and yes great thank you uh, I, I spent some time on it so but, yeah, I think so. It's uh, also but, nice. Yes, thank thank you for commenting. Yes, uh, yes, this is important. It is important for all astrologers or everyone interested in astrology. So to know the roots of these things and like that it was considered a science for a long time, even up until like Tycho Brahe, the Danish uh, astronomer, and with Kepler around that era i mean astrology was always it was everywhere basically so yeah uh just a quick rundown here on the important story nishap sampetosiris also semi-mythical but one of them a priest or one of them one of them a king uh purported to be so uh, they have these uh, basic doctrines where valence complains that they're writing in a very obscure way purposefully probably too on purpose probably so a lot of the techniques seem to have originated with Nehebs and Petosiris and now we're talking about Egypt so many things seem to originate in Egypt as well <clears throat> not only Babylonia uh, in Greece so <clears throat> Thrasilus again we mentioned him but Manilius wrote an astronomical poem Important Antiochus of Athens, important for basic things in Clitodemus, Dorothea of Sidon, <coughs> still extant. No, it, it was extant in Arabic texts. It was kind of a not complete, but he is great as well. And then Manetho, Egyptian name, I think. Yeah, and then continuing on uh, chronologically. I haven't put the numbers here, but the chronological figures, but Ptolemy were around first century, second century, second century after Christ. So Vettius Valens also, and then Julius Hermicus, fourth century, writing in Latin, Paternus, Paulus Alexandria, Notorious of Egypt, fifth century, sixth, I think, and Hippatia, the which probably was more of an astronomer and uh, Neoplatonist. But recently there has been found uh, uh, Evidence of a female astrologer around this time as well. So, but uh, it's there. There are like, um, for instance, Juvenal, one of the Roman poets, makes a satire of astrology. Sort of that <laughs> the the women are running with the 
No, the, the women can't. You know, he's making a satire of a girl that, that can't make a... She won't travel until she has consulted the books of Thrasicus. So like this idea that uh, it's in exceptional astrology and uh, electional astrology was considered so important by some persons that uh, they wouldn't even uh, conduct, wouldn't even go out to their home, homes without con consulting the stars. So he was kind of making fun, fun of that, but ex ex exaggerating. So we know that uh, there were female students of astrology and uh, yeah, practitioners as well, probably. So uh, yes, <clears throat> so I wanted to just take an example here. Of the Jimi Hendrix, so uh, as you see, quite a, kind of a stellium in the first house. Uh, uh, day chart, so and the suit because the sun is above the the ascendant, and the, it's in the fire triplicity. So <clears throat> with Venus and Mercury. Uh, Venus and Mercury ruling 10th and 11th and 7th in this first house. So <clears throat> considering angularity, this should be quite a prominent chart. As it is, of course, one of the most famous musicians ever. So one of the best. So and Mars in 12th house in, in, the, in his own uh, domicile. Now, looking at the rule of ascendant, the ascendant is important. The rule of ascendant, which is Jupiter, is exalted in the Cancer, conjunct the ruler of the moon. So just by that, and by the planets in the first, we can get an inkling of that this will be quite a prominent person, <clears throat> or quite a famous person as well. In Hellenistic text, is always, it's often... Uh, connected to fame and uh, fortune and wealth, when you have the 10th and the first house especially, like good com good configurations. But as we see, it's the Jupiter is retrograde. Retrograde was often quite negative, certainly in balance. And Jupiter is retrograde and Saturn is retrograde. So, and Jupiter is in the eighth house of death. And of course, Jimi Hendrix died very early. It was one of these individuals who came like a comet and like changed the music and changed things and just <clears throat> went on. He died 27 years old. <laughs> like <clears throat> kind of hard to understand today because it's only like during two or three years which he was active or famous and like in during that short period he was one of the most uh Paid, uh, the highest paid musician traveled like literally traveled all around the world so kind of Sagittarian themes here and uh, yeah so this idea of exalted even uh, I mean his death was kind of exalted because Jupiter is exalted in the crowd there so after his death he was even more famous so I mean I think most people have heard of the name at least not perhaps his music, but at least his name is very famous. So, yeah, the thing with the retrograde there is interesting in the eighth house. But at the same time being exalted. And then the stellium in the first. And then I've actually looked at the transits as well. I don't have much time really, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I've looked at the trans, I can mention it just quickly here, but uh, we have, we're two hours in this now, but um, might as well mention this as well. So, for instance, yeah, here's Mars in Scorpio in 12. So he was a, actually a military, or was a soldier for a short period for being a musician. So he was kind of forced into that as a young man, but he was, had much else to do troubled uh, upbringing them. His mother died early, so that's also like the moon in the eighth house, quite conspicuous, so probably impacted him. And the, uh, just generally for his fame and fortune, he has the ruler of his ascendant 
I mean, the ruler of the ruler. So Jupiter is the ruler of the sun, but the ruler of Jupiter is the moon. And the moon is uh, in its own domicile and sending a trine to all those planets in the first house. So that's quite, that's very good as well. So, well, well. Uh, so one more kind of negative thing was like he has sat in retrograde in seventh house. One of the things was he had problems generally with with women and like with the, his problems with good things also. So he had troubles of finding. I think uh, he was looking like for a partner, a life partner, so to speak. But he had he was kind of depressed. That I mean, he was so famous. So everybody, males and females, and everybody would just hang around, always hang around these people for money and fame and stuff like that so uh so he he was uh, for instance his fashion designer michael brown said uh he he wanted he wanted them to love him for who he was i mean he all the girls he had not because he was famous or played guitar but had money etc so he wanted like to basically find a life partner but it was <laughs> quite hard when you're so famous and everybody's just running after you <laughs> and uh, so he was kind of uh, depressed over this so that's interesting like Saturn sort of depression in the seventh house the retrograde but still angular Saturn is angular and ruling the second and third house so ruling his house of possessions I mean one of the most uh, wealthiest persons but uh, was also in debt at the end of his life so. So, yeah, but that's this is an important thing. So he's like, and his uh, fashion designer also said that they couldn't understand why he was sad about this because, like, five hundred girls lined up for him. So he's like, but uh, he he said uh, the the fashion designer said they just wanted a piece of him. They were stealing his clothes. Even he needed an entire new wardrobe on one occasion. <laughs> he had to call his his fashion designer to get an entire new wardrobe. So, yeah. Anyway, that's a bit about the negative things, which for him was like uh, personal and negative. I like this chord. He said, the blues is easy to play, but hard to feel. That's kind of a, it's a crap thing to say, I think. I mean, it's like emotions and stuff. And like, must have been a person with strong emotions because I'm, musicians are quite creative. Anyway, yeah, so uh, his father, Al Hendrick, said that he was, his son was like a scientist, always experimenting, discovering new ideas. And this is like, he has a ninth house, rule of a ninth house in the first house, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So short, shortly about when he died, the day, the day when he died, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the day when he died, 1970, <clears throat> 27 years old, he was in a fourth house perfection year. So his fourth house, <clears throat> his keys. I don't know. Ruled by Jupiter. So the annual perfection year was ruled by Jupiter, and Jupiter is in his eighth house. Retrograde. And it's ruler of his ascendant. So then you would think, okay, so this year has will have to do with uh, his persona, his personality, or his body, or everything to do with this person. And it's in one of the sort of bad houses, so he should be careful this year. Because it's also conjunct the moon. And the moon could also signify the body. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. And... Uh, for zodiacal periods, he has he had the level one, uh, level one, level two would be like always the most important that you look at. So his level one was at uh, ruled by Virgo in this period, and his level two period was ruled by Aquarius, Saturn then, up until for the first October. So he died around twentieth September, I think, nineteen seventy, like. A month before he would turn twenty-eight. So, uh, 
we will still make you know, Aquarius Saturn for a lot of fortune. So then you would look where Saturn was. So Saturn, his natal chart was opposite his first house. Retrograde. So then we'd also consider like, okay, so this is again something connected to himself. You should really be careful this year. And then you see at the transit, then you must also look at transit. So you would look at whenever during this period that the sun would transit uh, important uh, planets or important signs of the of his how his uh, natal chart. So you have uh, <clears throat> the the hour when it was said that his girlfriend found him dead, eleven a.m. eighteenth September eighteenth September nineteen seventy. Uh, Saturn was retrograde in Taurus. So in his sixth house of bodily injuries, quite telling really. So opposite his other malefic, Mars, malefic country, he'll say. So the, 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 the toughest planet for him would be Mars because it's a day chart. So both malefics are opposite each other, connected to illness. So, and during when he, his body was found, when he was found dead. And then the, the moon was in the seventh as well. No, I mean, the moon was in Taurus in the sixth house. And then opposite the ruler of his ascendant, together with Venus. And the ruler of his ascendant was in his twelfth house, uh, quite co-present with the malefic country to his chart. So all of these things, this symbolism is very clear, very clear, like that this person should have been very careful this period or like yeah but yeah so this is one when he died probably basically because he, he died around the morning there probably said to have been suffocated on, on his own uh, puke because he had taken like uh, sleeping tablets but it, this is unclear as well and there's also conspiracy theories about whether he was murdered or not but anyway, uh, let's not dwell on that. <laughs> um, uh, it was a, a sad, a sad day for him and for music. And another example, just quickly, because you have the honor here to look at one of the, my paintings here, Princess Diana. Uh, this is when I when I was practicing to paint, so it's it's not I could have done it much better, but it's um, uh, 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 the canvas was not the best. Anyway, this is a Princess Diana. In most pictures, she's actually laughing and being uh, and being uh, happy. So, but for several reasons, I painted painted like that. I have the, my moon in Scorpio, so. Might be because of that. Anyway, so she has the ascendant. Well, I found later that she has a similar uh, configurations to Jim Hendrix. And I didn't think about that before until I looked at the chart. Because I planned to show both of these charts. So anyway, she also has um, uh, Jupiter, uh, Sagittarius ascendant uh, and a placement in the eighth house as well. And of course, she died early as well. So and she has the sun in the eighth house, conjunct another retrograde planet, Mercury. So, uh, and uh, what, uh, what else? Yes, I mean, there's a lot to be said about this as well. So, she has uh, the moon in the third house. It was literally a royalty, so the, she was married to a <coughs> prince or King now, uh, so, and then uh, you have Jupiter close by there as well. So, <clears throat> and uh, the ruler of those two are in his own domicile, uh, Saturn in Capricorn, uh, in the second house. So, oh yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that this the whole sign system is very important for is the main system we're using now in holistic astrology. So, this is the whole sign system. So, uh, yeah. 
ruler of third and ruler of second in its own drama cell, but so yeah. Uh, and you would think that I mean she became quite famous and quite uh, very wealthy. I mean in turn because she was married to <laughs> royalty, so but the there are the retrogrades there as well, so there are problems, so to speak, and problems with wealth and fame and problems with I mean she was hunted by a paparazzi and said to be one of the reasons why she why her car crashed because the paparazzi was like hunting them after them. But there's great peculiarities about her death, so I won't go into that either. It's uh, it's quite a sort of conspiracy. That's what they call them now, but um, she believed herself that she, someone was after her, particularly her, her late husband. But <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I don't want to go into those things now. So uh, I mean, yeah, there was also accusations against her that she was like a bit erratic and stuff like that. But <clears throat> she must have. <clears throat> It is kind of a consensus that she had a bad time, bad time with her her husband's family. They were not treating her well. So, London. I mean, you have the you have the ruler of a seventh retrograde in the eighth house. I mean, that's not the best, really. But uh, under the beams. So. But at the same time, yeah, royalty. So. Anyway, so. Triplicity rulers, yeah, but a triplicity rulers just shortly here. Um, day chart, sun in Cancer. Then you had to, the, the uh, triplicity rulers for that would be the first part of her life would be Venus and second part would be Mars and Moon would be cooperating. So then you look for the first part of her life, it's like Venus <clears throat> in quite good actually because it's a dom own domicile, but not in the best house. Yeah, so I think she had like hard, she had a, her problems in upbringing, her parents' divorce and stuff like that. And then the second part of her life, sort of, this is really a rough sketch, but of this technique, but the second part would be Mars, Mars in 10th house, which is quite good, of course. Uh, angular, so you ex expect a bit better things, but ruled by Mercury as well, so being retrograde in 8th house. So. But there is a trine there from Saturn also. And there is a trine by sign from Venus as well. So, yeah. So that's uh, the triplicity rule of the sect light, the general life outcomes and stuff like that. <laughs> um, yeah. She has a ruler of fifth and tenth. Uh, she worked with the children uh, as a nurse. No, uh, what do you call it now? Uh, yeah, she 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 worked at the daycare place with children, and you have the MC degree in eleventh, imparting the signification of the tenth house, ruled by Venus associations, and Venus is in the sixth house. So she was famous for her like charity work, especially for the poor and sick, and the sixth house is always like for power. Signifying slaves and stuff, so, but so, in the Hellenistic text, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, so illnesses, slaves, and hard work and <clears throat> tough work. <clears throat> so, yeah, her MC is getting imparted the significations of the MC of the occupation, no, of the uh, work related things is connected to the sixth house, so yeah, and charity, Venus, so that's quite telling as well, yeah. Yes, this is the fin this is the end now. I'll finish now. Too hot. Uh, so this is the last example I really wanted wanted to take because I think this is this is the example that shows why we are studying really studying astrology and uh, one of the best reasons why we're studying astrology because this is a law professor an anonymous chart. <laughs> I can't confirm this, but from the chart, this is obvious. So. 
uh, <clears throat> the person who is also anonymous said that to is a law professor who was recently uh, diagnosed with paranoia, schizophrenia. So this shows how we can help people and how we can see beforehand the troubles of the charts and the troubles of the person. So you can sort of help them in the life, even from the day they're born, so to speak. Uh, so yeah, he was diagnosed with paranoia, schizophrenia. So the last year, this is what she said to the anonymous person. And she asked if the chart can provide insight into such conditions and what well, indicates suicidal tendencies and mental health issues. So if it helps to clarify, he's a law professor who has vivid hallucinations of being chased by the FBI in dealing with the legal consequences for deeds he didn't do. It would be interesting to see whether the things of punishment or justice play a significant role in this chart or how such elements might be assessed in your opinion. And very telling here, he has an ocular disease since the age of 20, resulting in partial blindness. So uh, the thing about that, first of all, is that in the Hellenistic texts, the sun and the moon are all, always connected to the uh, uh, eye diseases. So. And then you have the sun opposite his uh, ruler, contrary to the chart. So the most malefic here in this chart is Saturn, because it is a night chart, and it's retrograde. So it's quite telling that he might have some issues with either mind, or because the sun signifies mind, or the eyes. <laughs> now, the, the important th thing here is the placements the malefics and the oppositions and the houses. So, uh, Rhetorius says, one of the Hellenic astrologers, it is evident that the malefics alone in the angles or in the succeedant or an aspect of the lights produce injuries or sicknesses. And in the nymph, the third house, it, will, it was often indicative of like, literally what <clears throat> they would say is frenzy in the nymph house. The third house, if it, it was badly placed, frenzy making prophecies inspired by the gods, whether well, that could be positive as well. But the, the other side of the coin would be necromancers, sorcerers, <laughs> hallucinations, and madmen. So, uh, the idea of madness in the, the ancient world was it could be positive as well. Plato had an idea of divine madness. So, if you had a rational outcome of madness, for instance, you see Van Gogh, the painter. Dutch painter was considered sort of mad and was never recognized in his lifetime. He had, he seemed to have some, some sort of madness, but he's had a great output of paintings and beautiful paintings and like the colors and just the rational output of his sort of madness was quite positive. So this was the idea of many of the philosophers and the ancient peoples that some of these people were sort of possessed by the gods, so to speak. That, the ninth house is always, always ninth and third was connected to religion and such things. So, but when it is negative, or or in the fourth and tenth as well. So the malefic contrary to the sect Sidon, <coughs> ruling his sixth house, being retrograde and opposite to the, his son. And the sun signifying the 12th house of mental illness as well. So, And uh, he himself as ascendant is in the third house then. Uh, Mercury, ruler Virgo, and uh, ruled by another malefic. And very telling that his lot of fortune is contained by in the second house by Mars and the moon. It is sort of being dragged along by two planets there. One of them is malefic. And yeah. So this is this is all very telling that this person could have some issues. So, but, yeah. Yes. So, fortune, a lot of fortune is very important. So I could say more about this, but let's finish here. So these are the primary sources and the secondary sources. So, if anybody wants to contact me, here's my email as well. Thank you very much for today. So this it became a bit long, but we can save this for the future so, because we're recording it. So anybody has something to say or I'll stop the recording now. Um, and Bonnie, you have something to you want to share or something?
Um, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, that must have been so much work. It's such a huge topic. There's so much, um, you know, so much to learn about this. It's like the entire history of astrology. It's a lot. So thanks so much for putting this together. It's a great resource for picking into, um, you know, the history of our astrology. So that's amazing. Thank you. You're very welcome. Th thank you for listening. So, <clears throat> well, yeah, this is, there is very much to talk about. So, I mean, <laughs> the courses that are out there by the astrologers are huge. There's so much information. So, But I wanted to cover the most important things. So, yeah, we, we will save this now. I will stop the video now. Thank you all for listening and sharing your thoughts and questions.